me welcome everyone to uh, the first Storer Lecture of the 2015-2016 uh, year. I'd like to uh, first acknowledge the support of the Storer Endowment, which is making this lecture and then there will be others during the year possible. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, with us today Richard Lenski from Michigan State University. Uh, Rich got his uh, bachelor's degree from Oberlin College and his PhD from uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and uh, after a couple of uh, postdoctoral type positions, started out uh, down south in the, at UC Irvine, where he was an assistant and associate professor, and then moved in 1991 to Michigan State University. Uh, I could spend a long time going over his honors, but you'd much rather hear from Rich. Let me simply say that he's a, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and an elected uh, member of the National Academy of Sciences and is known for uh, truly uh, long-term experiments on E. coli. It's a, sort of a fascinating and interesting subject. Uh, tomorrow he'll be giving a seminar at 410 in uh, uh, Everson, 176 Everson Hall and I, the title is in your brochure, I don't have it with me. And today, uh, you can read the title, it's Time Travel and Experimental Evolution. Join me in welcoming Rich. Thanks, Alan. So I think the mic is on, it might be a little loud even. Okay, so it's a real pleasure to be here, see old friends, meet new people, and uh, it's just, it's great to be here. And so what I want to do is really tell you about this experiment that's gone on for uh, several decades in my lab. Uh, but before I did that, I wanted to just set a little stage historically. Um, Darwin, Charles Darwin, of course, is one of our scientific uh, uh, heroes, and he got a lot of things right. Um, two of his big ideas that he got right was the idea of descent with modification, that there is an evolutionary history to life on Earth, that things change over time. And he also is associated with the idea that one of the most important mechanisms of that change over time is this process of adaptation by natural selection. And this is a drawings, or yeah, I guess drawings you would say from John Gould, who uh, was drawing some of the specimens from Darwin's uh, visit to the Galapagos Islands and these Darwin's finches that had these different appearances depending on the species that had come from a common mainland population. But as much as we venerate Darwin, he didn't get everything right. So one of the things he got spectacularly wrong was his theory of inheritance. You know, he knew that there was inheritance, but he had this theory of gemules and something circulating in the blood that was somehow passed on uh, to subsequent generations. So he got that wrong, and it wasn't until, even though Mendel was a contemporary of his, it wasn't until um, the rediscovery of Mendel that people began to put together the genetic underpinnings of evolution with natural selection as a mechanism. Uh, uh, so that's one thing he got wrong. And then sort of more to the point of my talk today, he, he thought evolution was too slow to observe. Um, and he stated this quite explicitly at several places in the origin. And this is one that I like uh, quite a lot. And it's, I like it also because it shows Darwin around the age of when he was writing the origin as opposed to sort of the grizzled uh, look that we often see of Darwin. But he said, we see nothing of these slow changes in progress until the hand of time has marked the long lapse of ages. And then so imperfect is our view into the long, long past geological ages that we only see that the forms of life are now different from what they formerly were. So he's saying we really have to find ways to look in the past to see the process of evolution that we can't really directly uh, observe it. Um, and so that then is the challenge that evolutionary biologists face as a field. How do we look into the past? How do we understand uh, uh, ev evolution and act the process of evolution as it happened in a period when we cannot directly witness it. And so in a sense, all evolutionary biologists in different ways are interested in finding ways to travel in time. So that's true whether you're a paleontologist, so this is uh, this spectacular fossil that Neil Shubin and colleagues discovered of uh, Tiktaalik, which is sort of a transitional, uh, uh, sometimes it's called fishapod because it's sort of an aquatic form that uh, also uh, was sort of beginning to creep onto land. Uh, so that's one way of looking into the past is the, the fossil record. The comparative method is really what Darwin himself 
primarily focused on. So this is some photos of Anolis lizards from Jonathan Losos uh, and of, of, uh, uh, Mahler, Luke Mahler, uh, from some of the anole li lizards and some of the diversification that's witnessed uh, 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 and comparisons it can make about the habitats they use, the morphology they use uh, to achieve their adaptations to specific niches and so on. But in fact, Darwin was fundamentally wrong. You actually, you, these two, these are super powerful approaches of paleontology and comparative biology. But in fact, there are people who've watched evolution in action. So one of the really beautiful studies in this field, I don't know whether you've ever had them out for store lectures or others, but anyhow, uh, Peter and Rosemary Grant spent uh, about four decades, good parts of the year, um, on one of the Galapagos Islands watching Darwin's finches, um, Geospizes, the genus. They watched subtle changes in the morphology and the genetics uh, and in response to environmental changes, and they could observe the process of evolution in action, uh, even in a vertebrate organism. Now, they face tremendous challenges of, of the phenotypic variation, how much of it is inherited, and how much is simply effects of the environment on the organism, figuring out what the fitness consequences of these subtle morphological variants were and everything. It's tremendous Herculean uh, biology. But they demonstrated that you could see evolution in action in this context. And any process that you can directly observe, I think, I don't know about, maybe that's too strong a statement, but uh, many processes that you can directly observe, at least you, that means you can do experiments about them. Because we can see the process, we can begin to think about how we would experimentally uh, uh, study that process. And so that's the gist of what I'm going to be telling you about today, is this experiment that's been going on in my lab. So, why did I start this experiment? And I have several, hypo several questions more than hypotheses, and some of them I'll focus on more tomorrow. But today I wanted to sort of focus on, to me, a question that I've always just been enamored with. I think it, I, and that is how reproducible is evolution? And I'm actually just fascinated with that in general. I always liked games uh, growing up that were a mixture of luck and skill, that interplay of kind of, you can be really good at something, but things can go against you, or you can be really bad at something, and you get, you know, the royal flush uh, poker hand or something. And, and so much of life is this mixture of kind of, we think of, of, of uh, sort of sort of deterministic aspects, and then these sort of random components. And in evolution, one s way of thinking about this tension is between the randomness of mutation uh, that, that it doesn't mean that all mutations happen at the same rate, but what we mean by that is that organisms in general are not saying, oh, I need this mutation and I'm going to engineer myself to, to give myself this new ability or whatever. So there's this randomness of mutation, and yet natural selection is sort of weeding out mutations, finding mutations that confer advantages, and sort of systematically, given an environment and a genetic context, potentially pushing organisms or populations along similar paths. So this is a tension I was interested in exploring in this experiment. And that tension, in principle, allows us to both begin to see the underpinnings of the diversification of life um, and the random factors that contributed to that, as well as environmental differences. But also there are these spectacular cases of either parallel evolution or this example of convergent evolution, where in response to similar environmental pressures, like the information that can be gathered from light in the environment, organisms as diverse as cephalopod mollusks and vertebrates, we have eyes that are structurally very similar to one another, even though the common ancestor of mollusks and of vertebrates did not have uh, the camera-like eyes that they both have independently evolved. And so this is a spectacular example of sort of an adaptive convergent evolution. So if we want to study this tension between randomness in evolution and sort of the directional pressure forces, however you want to think of it, that natural selection can produce, what we want is a study system that, first of all, if we're going to look at repeatability, we have to have replicates. So it's nice to have things that are grow in small spaces in the lab, like flax, flasks of bacteria. And we want to be able to revisit the past. We want to be able to really travel in time. And I'll tell you how we do that in this experiment. So this is an experiment. I call it the long-term evolution experiment. I originally intended it to go at least a year, but in fact, it's now in its 27th or 28th year. So I started with 12 populations of E. coli. They're the exact same strain as one another. Um, it's the strain that Lurie and Delbrook worked with, by the way, but um, let's see. 
It's the same strain. They've all been inoculated. Each one was inoculated from a separate colony, a separate clone, a separate individual. They differ, however, in that six of the populations have one state of a genetic marker, and six of them have another state, a different state of the genetic marker, which has no consequences for how they grow in the liquid environment, but it affects whether they make red or white colonies on a particular kind of petri dish. And that allows us to do experiments, like to compete a white population against a red population and be able to tell them apart. So anyhow, this experiment has these 12 populations. And they're propagated every day by taking one tenth of a milliliter out of the liquid and putting it into 10 mils of fresh medium. So it's a hundredfold dilution. They're growing in a very simple environment with no other species. It's just sugar water, basically. Uh, there is, besides glucose, the sugar, there is another carbon source in there, which in the later part of my talk I'll come back to, that's called citrate. It's in this, in this recipe as a chelating agent that binds to iron and makes the iron bioavailable to E. coli. But E. coli, going back to the original definition of E. coli as a species, it can't grow on citrate. It cannot transport citrate into the cell. Anyhow, this daily 1 to 100 dilution, and we do it on weekends, holidays. I'm obviously not doing it. They don't let me in the lab much these days. But anyhow, uh, they, we, we do these daily dilutions. Every day, they get diluted 100-fold. And then they begin to grow. So bacteria grow by binary fission, so 2, 4, 8, 16. And then they'll eventually run out of the glucose. And so that turns out to be sort of the number of generations is the log base 2, the number of doublings um, of uh, that get up to 100. So it's about 6 and 2 thirds doublings, or 6 and 2 thirds generations every day. So I started this in February of 1988. And uh, it's uh, uh, now up over 63,000 63, generations to date. Now, what we know from the size of the bacterial populations, the size of their genomes, the mutation rate, billions, every one of these flask lineages has had literally billions of mutations occur in it. But the vast majority of those mutations are lost during the daily 100-fold dilution. That's what we would call random genetic drift. Many of them produce deleterious phenotypes. They screw up some aspect of the performance of the organism. And, and so on. So we don't really know, when I started this experiment, how many mutations would really enter the genome over the course of the first year or now the first 20-some you know, years. And I, uh, by the way, I switched from, I did my PhD on insects, and I switched to microbes for my postdoc. I've never actually had a course in microbiology in my life. But I switched because, first of all, I was getting frustrated. Field work is really hard. I realized my talents weren't there. But I also, um, I was very attracted to the number of generations one can have in an experiment like this. But actually, as I look back at it, the most amazing thing about this system is that we have a frozen fossil record. We have every 500 generations, each of the populations, after we take the 1% of the population and move it to the fresh medium, we take the remaining 99% of the population add glycerol, which is a cryoprotectant, and put it at minus 80 centigrade in a deep freezer. So we have this frozen fossil record. And it's not just like a record of what the cells look like. And it's not just a record of their DNA, although those things are great to have. They are viable organisms. And so we can bring them out of the freezer and do things like compare and even directly compete with organisms that lived at different points in time. So that's really sort of this essence of this, this time travel. It's an incredibly important aspect of it. Um, so I like to sort of say that we have three kinds of time travel that I'll illustrate that are part of this experiment. So one is the fact that because these are fast reproducing, we can watch evolution as it occurs. So we have evolution kind of going forward. Then because we've got this frozen fossil record, we can go back in time. So we can kind of look backwards in time. And you can see that even though the bacteria can go kind of backward and forward in time in this experiment, I've only been traveling in one direction and accumulating more, more white hairs and so on. But there's another neat thing you can do. And that is we can go forward again when something interesting happens in the experiment, something we might not have even noticed when it happened. We can go back into our frozen fossil record and begin to explore whether if we started over from particularly interesting points in time in our experiment, would we find that there was sort of a historical contingency 
that the past dependence had led certain populations by virtue of things that had happened in their past that began to push them along one direction in the future or another direction in the future. And that's what I call sort of a replay experiment. I'll explain what Zach Blount in this picture is doing with these giant stack of Petri dishes uh, in the second half of the talk. So what can we do with this kind of experiment? So one of the things we can do is we can actually directly measure the competitive performance of bacteria relative to their ancestor because we can take these frozen samples out of the freezer, acclimate them or grow them in the conditions of this long-term experiment, and then mix a different generation with its ancestor. And again, we use this trick of the red and the white colonies because otherwise if we mix them, we wouldn't be able to tell who is who, but we compete the red evolved populations against the white ancestor, the white evolved populations against the red ancestor. And we define fitness in this system as the ratio of the growth rates of the evolved bacteria relative to their ancestor. Um, so it's the, it's the rate not measured one in isolation and the other in isolation, but as they directly compete head to head for the common pool of resources under the condition where the evolution experiment occurred. So I like to say it's a little bit like, you know, with we've got Neanderthal bones, and now many of you know we've got the Neanderthal genome, which is fantastic. We've got the uh, Denisovan genome, but really wouldn't it be cool to have these things back to like, you know, how good would they be at giving lectures, playing chess, playing music, you know? See, we, we, it's really hard to answer those questions, but here in this experiment, what I'm showing is um, one of the 12 populations, its fitness relative to the ancestor over 50,000 generations. So by definition and by measurement with this marker having no effect on fitness, it starts out at a relative fitness of one, rises quite rapidly in fitness, and begins to slow down. And I'll talk tomorrow about reasons we don't think it will actually ever stop. It just gets slower, the rate of increase. But anyhow, after 50,000 generations, this population is about 80%, grows about 80% faster than did its ancestor. Well, what if instead, and all of our populations kind of look like that. I'm not going to walk you through tons of the data, but what if we do a different experiment? What if instead of competing the populations against their ancestor, what if we take population red number one and white number one and compete them against one another? So we're not competing here relative to the ancestor, but two populations relative to one another. In this case, it's kind of arbitrary which one is in the numerator or denominator, but again, they start out with equal fitness. For a few thousand generations, the one that's in the denominator seems to be leading in the fitness race, and the one in the numerator catches up and overtakes it, and I don't want to make too much about the subtleties of the deep. There are some significant deviations from one in this and significant trends, but those of you at least in the front might notice the scale is very different on this graph from the one I showed you before. It goes only from about 0.95 to 1.05, so if we put the relative fitness of these two lines competing against one another on the same scale that I showed you a moment ago, it's basically saying they're climbing, they're adapting to the environment, they're climbing in fitness in very, very similar trajectories. Not identical, but they, they, it's, it's remarkable at this sort of gestalt, sort of most integrative level of organismal performance, they are strikingly similar in their uh, improvement. Now, one of the things I also have to make clear is that we're measuring fitness in the environment where the evolution takes place, the same temperature, the same pH, the same chemical constitution, the same resources, but we can test them. We can do those competition experiments in different environments from the ones where they evolved. And so this is just summarizing some data from actually way early in the experiment from generation 2000, where these black, line, uh, black symbols are showing the relative fitness after 2,000 generations, so quite early in the experiment, in the environment where they evolved, with glucose as the limiting carbon source. And you can see that all the populations are about 20 or 30 percent more fit than their ancestor. Fitness is of about 1.2 or 1.3. What if we keep everything the same but change the carbon source? And it's a rather subtle carbon source change we're making here. We're changing from glucose to maltose. Maltose is diglucose. And yet, when we measure their fitness in the same environment except with this other sugar, not only are their fitnesses generally lower in maltose than in glucose, some of them are actually less fit even than their ancestor was. So we're seeing this incredible specificity of the adaptation to the exact conditions under which they evolved, and all bets are off about whether these bacteria are gaining or losing fitness in some other novel environment. <laughs>
and we're gathering lots of information of that sort. But I just wanted to make it very clear that when I talk about fitness, unless I qualify it in some other way, I'm really meaning fitness in the environment of the evolution experiment and where their recent history has been. Now, another interesting thing about a long-term experiment is like sometimes students and other people have asked me, like, kind of in 1988, were you kind of imagining that whole genome sequencing would be possible? Well, it turns out, no, I'm, I'm not at all kind of like technical uh, dreamer sort at all. Um, in fact, the first bacterial genome wasn't sequenced, and, or at least it wasn't published until 1995. I don't know what that project cost, but I'm guessing millions of dollars to sequence a Haemophilus genome. And, um, and so I'd started this experiment seven years before that, and you know, for many years after that, it was extremely expensive to sequence genomes. But the really cool thing is the, the rate of improvement and the reduction in cost made it possible that in the mid 2000s, the middle of the last decade, we began to say, hey, we can afford to start doing some of the sequencing on our bacteria. And so um, what we did, and it seemed quite heroic at that time, now we do much, much more, but what we did was we sequenced our ancestral strain and then we sequenced from one population, one genotype that we isolated at 2,000 generations, one from 5,000 generations, one from 10,000, and so on, up to 20,000. Uh, we also did some later time points, but things get complicated uh, uh, in ways that I think I'll talk about tomorrow, but not today. But anyhow, what this circle diagram then shows is this in inner circle is sort of a cartoon representation of the circular genome of our ancestor. The next circle out, which has only a few of these little marks on it, is the genome, shows, marks the position and the type of mutation that we found at 2,000 generations. The next circle out is the one at 5,000 generations, 10,000 generations, and so on. So anyhow, out of these billion or so mutations that might have accumulated in this lineage, by 20,000 generations, the clone we sequenced had a total of 45 mutations. About two-thirds of those were point mutations, and about one-third of them were various indels, that means like insertions or deletions of little bits of DNA, or in some cases fairly big bits, including in one case, well, there's one of them that's this inversion, where about a third of the chromosome had been flipped around in its orientation. Now, E. coli genome has, roughly speaking, 4,000 genes in it, 4,000 protein-coding genes in its genome, and yet, 45 of, I just showed you there were 45 mutations. Okay, some of the mutations might affect a couple of genes, but to the first approximation, we can say, okay, only about 1% of the genes have a mutation after 20,000 generations. Now, before it was possible for, to go, for us to start sequencing all of the populations, what we could do is say, oh, let's look at what's happening in genes where we found mutations in this population. What's happening in the other 11 populations? And what we found was many cases where the mutation, the genes that had a mutation in this population also had mutations in other populations. So I'm showing just two extreme examples here where we found a mutation in population number one. Only about 1% 1 of the genes have mutations, and yet 11 out of 11 of the other populations also had single mutational differences. In almost every case, it's a different mutation but it's showing parallel evolution or convergent evolution, the repeatability of evolution, that natural selection is fishing out mutations in the same targets independently in these replicate populations. And I sort of jumped the gun, but basically this parallelism implies selection has favored those mutations. And one of the beautiful things about working in a model system like E. coli, where geneticists have learned all these tricks and done this beautiful biology for you know half a century, uh, is that we can make what we call isogenic constructs, where we manipulate individual mutations and make strains that are identical except for those mutations. And we've done that for many of these genes where we found this parallel evolution. And in every case where we've tested it, where we found parallel evolution, in fact, we can demonstrate that those mutations are causally associated with an improvement in competitive ability. Sometimes they're little subtleties, like it might require a combination of mutations, but the evidence is that these parallel changes are, in fact, beneficial to the bacteria. Now, I want to sort of switch gears. I'm going to come back to my experiment, but I don't know, sort of, it's hard to judge, especially with these public lectures, how diverse the audience would be, but maybe there's some people here who are interested in, in biomedical students' uh, applications. I want to talk about kind of a really neat study uh, 
Uh, I really love the co-authors of this paper, Tammy Lieberman working with Roy Kashoni. Uh, humans, there's a disease, most of you have probably heard of it, called cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a hereditary disease, a hereditary condition, and it makes the individual who inherits that condition susceptible to infections, including especially of their lungs. Uh, so they're vulnerable to these infections. And there, was an out, there have been many outbreaks of these infections associated with different clinics and so on. In fact, sort of a little bit of a tragedy, but in the past they used to have like summer camps for kids with cystic fibrosis, and the problem is summer camps are great places to exchange pathogens. And so they've now learned to do things differently. But there was an outbreak in the Boston area in the 1990s where several dozen uh, patients uh, with, who were being treated for cystic fibrosis came down with a bacterium called Burkholderia delosa, which was a very dangerous lung pathogen. And these clinicians, again, they started, they started collecting these samples and saving these bacteria before genome sequencing was possible, but the clinicians, again, maybe they were more foresighted than me, but for whatever, certainly genetic tests of various sorts were possible, and they were accumulating this collection of these bacteria from different patients but all from the same outbreak. And then in a paper published in uh, Nature uh, Genetics in 2011, Tammy Lieberman, Roy E. Kishoni, and a variety of their co collaborators sequenced about 100 genomes out of this one outbreak from many different patients and many different time points. And what struck me, and I, uh, sort of jumping ahead to the message, I'll just show you tiny bits of what they did, but it kind of looks so much like our experiments. I mean, it's like these patients are in not the details of the environment, obviously it's a different organism, a different environment, but the sort of way in which they were able to make sense of the genomic evolution and the evidence of parallelism in particular. Now one challenge, it turned out not to be a big challenge, but a very important difference between our experiment and their natural outbreak was that we deliberately started each of our populations from a single cell derived from the same genotype so they didn't share any genetic variation. Our flasks are evolving independently. But in an outbreak, it started with one patient, spread to two patients, and so on. So the first thing they had to do was to construct sort of a phylogenetic tree of this outbreak to trace the transmission history. And so they constructed this phylogeny where this patient called patient A, it, the, the arrows sort of imply which one trans A gave it to patient M. A also gave it to this cluster of patients, but there's not enough signal in the genomic data to say, you know, did C give it to E. So they put a big circle around these four patients. One or more of these patients then gave it to patient D, to patient K, to patient I, G. H gave it to L, J, and N. So the point is they can disentangle what, what might have been a mutation that happened back here and was present in all of these guys because simply it was just a mutation that didn't confer a benefit necessarily, but was dragged along with the transmission process, they can distinguish that from mutations that might have happened independently in this patient and in this patient and this patient and this patient. So they can disentangle the co-inherited sort of parts of the genome from the independently evolved parallelism, and that's what our experiment was designed to do, is ask what is parallel between these flasks. They have to do this additional step in between, but they can make the same uh, kind of inferences that we did. And using that logic, and again, I'm not going to work through their de details, but they were able to identify 17 different genes uh, that within the course of this outbreak showed highly significant statistical evidence that those genes were under positive selection in the lungs of these patients. That is, they were arise, different mutations typically, but in the same gene were independently arising at different points in this evolutionary outbreak. And of course, this is very basic research being done in a clinical outset, so I mean, I'd love to say, and as a result of this, a new treatment was discovered. That's not generally the way science works. There are many, many intermediate steps. But what they've shown is how the bacteria are taking advantage of this diseased lung situation, and at least potentially that may lead to new therapies uh, and so on. But it, I, this is sort of a little interlude that the kind of logic that's being done in my experiment can be extended into these biomedical realms. And it, it just I won't show any data on it, but it's been very fascinating to me now that a lot of cancer biologists are using the same kind of inferences now. They can deeply sequence the genomes of cancer cells, and they're beginning to ask, well, like of all these mutations in, in tumor cells, 
Which ones are the same in different patients suggesting, and again, those would be independent evolutionary events. It's kind of short-term evolution experiments that's really bad for us, but in some sense, something that gives that cancer cell a growth advantage relative to its neighbors. What do those mutations have in common? Anyhow, back to my experiment. I've shown you just a little bit of a lot of the kinds of data that we collect where we found this evidence of this parallel fitness trajectories, the fact that replicate lines are evolving I don't want to say lockstep, that's too extreme, but there's a lot of similarity in the rates of the adaptation in these populations, and that's underlain by, if not identical mutations, a lot of overlap in the genetic targets between these populations. And so the evolutionary biologists often talk about natural selection and evolution as occurring in fitness landscapes. And I guess evolutionary biologists are optimistic and physicists are pessimistic, because in physics, in chemistry, everything goes to energy minima. Everything's falling downhill. Evolutionary biologists always talk about, like Richard Dawkins' book, Climbing Mount Improbable. There's a sort of image that evolution, natural selection in particular, are pushing populations up gradients of fitness and finding solutions to problems. And so what I've shown you so far is, and they represent this as kind of a two, three-dimensional cartoon, but of course, genetics is very highly multi-dimensional. But the idea of this is, you know, we've we start with a strain of E. coli, call it A for ancestor. We plunk it in this arbitrary laboratory environment and ask, what does it do? It gets more fit. The populations are very similar. They're kind of like all climbing Mount Glucose in similar ways. They're not doing it identical. The mutations aren't exactly the same, and some of the other phenotypes aren't the same. But it really looked like, uh, during the first much of the experiment, I was incredibly impressed by just how much parallel evolution there was within this experiment. To be honest, I was a little bit more of the school that every population was going to run off in different directions, but a lot of parallel evolution. But then a very striking example came along, that after about 30,000 generations, 32,000 generations, one of these 12 populations suddenly realized that, oh, every night we go to bed, you know, after we eat the glucose, and we don't realize there's this nice lemony citrate uh, uh, in the medium. So one of the 12 populations we realized uh, was growing on the citrate in the medium. I was convinced we had a contaminant in the experiment, uh, but as we checked more and more, we realized it has the, it's an E. coli, it has the genetic markers of our strain, and as we've done whole genome sequencing, you know, we can actually begin to reconstruct the history of how it happened. And yet, as I said, a diagnostic feature of E. coli, going back to its definition, um, is that it can't transport, well, they didn't know it was transport, but they know it can't grow uh, uh, on citrate as a carbon source in an environment where there's oxygen. And these are well-stirred, small flasks. There's plenty of oxygen around. And yet this one population uh, figured out how to do it. So I had a very talented postdoc in my lab, Christine Borland, trained as a molecular geneticist at Yale, came into my lab. And she was trying all the tricks of the genetic microbial genetics trade this was, again, a little bit before whole genome sequencing, but she was trying to do things like use viruses to map the gene that allowed them to grow on citrate. And basically, nothing was working. She wasn't able to make progress to figure out the genetics. And there are a couple of reasons that might have happened. One is that it might involve a big chunk of DNA, which wouldn't be easily captured by these traditional microbial genetic things, which involve sort of packing a, re a small region of DNA into a virus and moving the genes around that way. Another possibility is it involves several mutations at different parts of the chromosome that similarly would not be easily moved around. So being evolutionary biologist, Zachary Blount, who was then a graduate student, is now a postdoc with me, said, well, let's kind of think more conceptually about what might be going on here. And we all, you know, you often begin by putting things into kind of extreme categories of it could be this or it could be that. In fact, it turns out to be probably a bit of both. But we sort of said, maybe it's an extremely rare mutation. Even though there have been these billions of mutations, and probably every single point mutation has happened many times over in each of these flasks, maybe it's an inversion that has to be exactly this base pair and exactly this base pair, and we don't really know what the rates of those kinds of mutations are. So maybe this change could have happened at any point in the history of this population. We just happened to see it at one point in time. The alternative is that as they're climbing up Mount Glucose, they're not taking the exact same path. And so it's like they're all climbing up the same face of Mount Everest, but one of them goes around a little bit you know, to the southeast side and essentially ends up in a, maybe a small valley or more likely sort of a saddle point of some sort 
where now in that genetic context, it has the potential to acquire mutations that drive it in a different direction evolutionarily. So is this just sort of a super rare event or is it a historically contingent event? So Stephen Jay Gould is a late uh, sort of polymath, a, a paleontologist by training, a historian of science, a, a, a popularizer of science, and he wrote this book that a lot of the biology is now maybe not what's accepted, but it's a very provocative book, highly recommend it, called Wonderful Life. Um, and he was uh, talking about the fossils in a place called the Burgess Shale in, in northwest Canada that has some of the earliest fossils of metazoan, multicellular animal body plans. And it's, it, he was asking kind of like if we could start over from that point in time how similar would evolution come out? So he says, I call this experiment replaying life's tape. By the way, who plays tapes anymore? I mean, it shows you how fast cultural evolution is. You know, I have my old Toyota Corolla that still has a tape, but I think I'm probably the only person in the room who's played one in the last year. Anyhow, you press the rewind button, go back to any time and place in the past, and let the tape run again and see if the repetition looks at all like the original. And he says, the bad news is this is just a thought experiment. We can't really do the experiment unless we have replicate planets and really big grants, you know, uh, and long time scales. But because we have this frozen fossil record, we can, on, if you grant me the difference in scale, both temporal and spatial, we can go back into the lineage of this population and start asking questions about whether it matters what genotype we start with whether we will get to this new citrate utilizing phenotype. Um, and so that's where this huge picture with Zachary, that's about a third of the Petri dishes that he used in a set of experiments. Originally, our so the idea, let me be clear on this, the idea is not to ask when the first citrate positive cell was there, although we did find some interesting stuff that there were some low frequency of citrate guys before we knew about it, but instead we're saying, when do we go back and find citrate minus genotypes that are capable of making the transition to citrate positive? And does that sort of probability of making that transition change over the course of the experiment? So originally he intended to do all of this in flasks, so to make everything just as similar as possible to the main experiment I've been describing. But it quickly became clear this was a very difficult transition for the cells to make, and he wasn't going to be able to scale the experiment up in flasks. So instead, what he realized is he can take like one particular, you know, the ancestor, and he can grow up a billion cells and spin them down in a centrifuge and put them on a petri dish where the only thing, the only carbon source is citrate. And he can put that in the incubator for a month. And he can do a clone from 2,000 generations and put that in the incubator. So he can literally test. So in this experiment, he tested 40 trillion cells for their ability. Could they make a colony, would any of these 40 trillion cells make a colony on this minimal citrate agar, even if they were incubated for a month? And uh, uh, I think outside of the pharmaceutical industry, this is probably one of the largest, uh, maybe the largest mutational screen of this sort done. So. Zero of 10 trillion ancestral cells ever produce this. And notice, the, I kind of put it up there as a joke that way, but notice the, I'm specifying now the ancestral cells because he can't handle all of these Petri dishes at once. So what he's doing is he's taking these different genotypes out, but we always included, and he's doing you know, different series of genotypes at different time points and in different weeks and months in the lab. He always included the ancestor as sort of part of every replicate block of the experiment, as you will. So a lot of the effort goes into the ancestor. And zero out of 10 trillion cells ever produced a colony on the minimal citrate medium. So did he get angry? He didn't get angry, despite this fun picture. His experiment was a really cool success. Because what he found was that the ancestor never produced this transition. And no clone that started from about 20,000 generations or early ever made this transition. But he actually found another 19 evolutionary transitions from citrate minus to citrate positive. But they always occurred from generation 20,000 onward. And that, we don't know that boundary with super precision. And in fact, it really looks like there were sort of a couple of transitions, one to go from impossible to really super rare, and then another one from super rare to a little bit less super rare. Um, that most of these mutations showed up in backgrounds from about 30,000 generations or 29,000 generations. 
So what it's telling us is that by virtue, it, that this, it's saying this hypothesis is at least part of the explanation that as they're climbing up Mount Glucose, they're changing in their potential to make the transition uh, over to this citrate. So they're stumbling on routes that open up new doors in evolutionary space. Now as we're doing this evolutionary replay experiment, again, sequencing technology is getting better, the costs of this are getting lower, so then we had a paper a couple of years, a few years ago now, where we sequenced 30 genomes just from this one population. So what we have is the ancestors, and I'm representing it as kind of a phylogenetic tree here, because you can really see not only fitness changes and new functions evolved, but you can, like in that Lieberman and Kishoni paper, you can construct phylogenetic trees. So the ancestral genome is down here. We sequenced a genome from 2,000 generations, 5,000, 10, 15, several up here at 20,000 and 30,000 and so on. Interestingly, something jumped out at us that we didn't realize was that this population, even before the citrate evolved, and this, that's where this transition from yellow to red is, even before then, this population had kind of diverged into, diverged into three lineages, and we're sort of trying to understand how in this single carbon environment uh, they were already stably, co well, it's a question of just how stable this coexistence was, or were they just all evolving uh, more or less uh, on similar paths. But anyhow, out of these different lineages, uh, this is the one in which this change emerged. There had been, by the time it emerged, there were about 75 or 80 mutations in the genome. Um, some of you who know, there's actually just announced a Nobel Prize, was it yesterday or today, for uh, uh, the discovery of, or the characterization of some of the uh, enzymology involved in DNA repair. And it turns out some of our populations evolved changes in their DNA repair processes that led to elevated mutation rates. And you might say, ah, maybe that's what's going on. This population evolved it but only after it had become citrate positive. We know that because we've got a number of clones that uh, are citrate positive that don't have that, what's called a mutator phenotype. But interestingly, you can see when that mutator phenotype arises, the rate of genetic divergence goes much, much higher. Anyhow, then now to make sense, okay, we've got these gene, you know, we've got these 30 genomes. What do we do there? And we sort of said, okay, logically, we're interested in sort of three processes, three sort of evolutionary epochs with respect to what happened in this population. Um, one, I'll start in the middle, one would be sort of what we called actualization. What was the mutation that made you go, the cell go from a citrate minus to being able to use citrate, however weakly, and we know that the first guys who could do it were extremely bad at it, but they could get a tiny bit out of it. And then after something evolves that's a new function, it's not like these things evolve perfectly, so there's a stage called refinement, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. I'm a little embarrassed to tell you what we really wanted to find out, and there now are several labs working on this, or at least a couple of labs besides ours working on this, is what were the mutations that set the stage? So we still haven't, even having complete genomic information, we're not sure of which of these, you know, 60 or 70 mutations that occurred before the change were involved in sort of setting a genetic background or context, in which case this key event that we call the actualization occurred. But I can tell you about the actualization. So it turns out the actualization was a tandem duplication of a gene called CIT-T, which uh, despite its name is not the homolog of the transporters that related bacteria used to bring citrate in. It's not a very well-studied gene. I think there are only one or two papers before ours that, that really talk about this gene. But interestingly, this gene encodes an anaerobic transporter, not only of citrate, but of several other carbon sources. So it brings citrate into the cell by pumping something else out into the environment, a related similar chemical kinds of molecules like succinate, into the environment. But it only works under anaerobic conditions. It's, the gene is only expressed under anaerobic conditions. Now you might say a duplication, oh you're increasing the dose of something and that puts you over a threshold and lets the cell eke out enough energy, but it turns out that's not actually what's going on. When you think about a duplication, a duplication means that the regulatory elements that are upstream of this one and might work under a upstream of the original copy, they might work, allow expression of this gene in an anaerobic environment, but when you make a duplication, the second copy may have new regulatory elements that had been downstream of the first copy 
that are now upstream of the second copy. And I'm not going to kind of go into the sort of molecular evidence, but what we were able to show was that that was the source of this ability to grow on the citrate, was taking an existing transport protein and existing regulatory functions and gluing them together just right. And it, again, it turns out it's a very low frequency event to generate these, because even those 19 that Zach saw imply a mutation rate that's way, way below, and none of them were point mutations. It implies quite rare events. But what it's basically saying is that the cell was rewired by combining existing parts. And so it's very much like Jacob talked about. Evolution doesn't build whole new things builds by tinkering with existing components. And so the cell was rewired in this context by bringing this regulatory element into proximity with an existing gene, generating a new module and a new physiological capacity. So the last few minutes, I want to talk about, well, does this mean we've got a new species? And I don't really, there's big, just, you know, microbiologists talk about species in some ways, and even different microbiologists talk about it in different ways, and plant biologists and animal biologists, they think about these things quite differently. But I just want to sort of hit on some ways we're thinking about it. I'm really more interested in sort of the, I don't care what you call something, I'm interested in what does it tell us about some of the potential evolutionary processes of interest. So new species would depend on definitions, so just several issues that might come to mind. One is cladogenesis. Cladogenesis just is a fancy way of saying lineage is splitting. Because evolution can involve something replacing its ancestor, but some people would say to say something's a new species, really we'd like to see something that is a branch point in evolution, where not only the sit plus arise, but did it drive the sit minus extinct? And it turns out it's quite interesting. For at least 10,000 generations, those guys coexisted. And we could show that was a stable coexistence. Because as they became able to use the citrate, they weren't as efficient at growing on the glucose. So you might say, OK, that's consistent with it. Also, it's not simply that they're growing faster. They're doing something new. So it's a discrete change. That's not super satisfying, because you could say, well, then that makes everything that's antibiotic resistant. You know, that's, a new, that, that's too loose a definition. But this one's sort of a meaningful novelty. It's not just any sort of run-of-the-mill change. It's one that contradicts a historical definition of one of the most well-studied species on Earth. But that's still not, from an evolutionary perspective, all that satisfying. So there's this concept in evolutionary biology. It really goes back to Darwin. Was, it's pretty clear he was thinking along some of these lines. But Ernst Meyer really put this as sort of a beginnings of a theoretical framework where he emphasized that what we mean by species is not things that look similar or look different, but it's that they're reproductively separated from one another, that they, that they either don't ever reproduce, or if they do reproduce, it's only, it might produce offspring that are less fit than either parent. And so that means that the populations have begun to move into sort of different evolutionary, onto different evolutionary paths. Well, we've got a problem with that definition, but we're going to try to overcome it. So bacteria fundamentally are asexual organisms. That is, they reproduce by copying and dividing themselves. But many of you know that, well, yes, they're asexual in their reproduction, but they can move DNA around by sometimes plasmids, sometimes viruses. And in some species, although not E. coli, they can actually take up naked DNA from the environment. But I didn't mention at the beginning we started with a strain of E. coli deliberately to make things simple, and so we could use these genetic markers in the competition experiment and so on. There are no viruses in this system. There are no plasmids, and E. coli is not able to take up DNA from the environment. But we can, as sort of geneticists, begin to play tricks. We can take the citrate minus bacteria and the citrate positive bacteria, and this is work in progress, by the way, what I'm talking about now, unpublished work, but we can try to generate hybrids between those two and ask, are they ecologically inferior? Are they neither fish nor fowl? That would imply that sort of a maladaptive valley has begun to emerge between these two so that if there were gene flow, if there were recombination or sex of some sort, that would present a barrier to gene flow. So it's, it's kind of like taking an experiment that's already artificial and now introducing another artificiality in it. But the point is to try to explore what happens when a species makes an innovation that puts it on a different evolutionary path and how that path would or wouldn't mix well with the path that the population otherwise was on. So what it's kind of predicting is that 
as they get better, and this is our member, I mentioned the word refinement, that as they get better and better at climbing Mount Citrate, it predicts that the valley becomes deeper and deeper But if you sort of throw a genotype that's sort of intermediate between the glucose adapted lines and the citrate one. Now this cartoon's a little bit unfortunate because you'd say, well, it must be growing deeper because as they're going up higher here, there's a valley emerging, but that's a, that's a cartoon version. You could imagine that there's a ridge that actually connects these solutions sort of in some other dimension that isn't pictured here. So we really do have to do the experiment. Um, so the first prediction of this kind of way is, is refinement occurring? So the first thing we wanted to show was if we take later generation citrate positive bacteria and compete them against earlier generation citrate positive bacteria, are they getting better? So instead of competing them against the ancestor, what Zach's data showing, are showing here is we are competing later generation CIT positive bacteria against the earliest CIT positive bacteria we have. And in fact, they are getting more and more adapted to growing in this citrate niche. So that's showing, that's sort of trivial in a way, but it's showing this refinement is occurring, that it wasn't just one step to become perfect on citrate. Now what we can do, we're trying to generate lots of recombinants, but doing this in bacteria is not the easiest thing to make hybrids between different things. But what we can do is at least generate one very interesting kind of hybrid. And that is where we, in a sense, pull the rug out from the citrate positive bacteria. They have this duplication that makes them able to grow on citrate. And the ones from later generations have various mutations that contribute to their refinement. What if we now remove the mutation that allows them to grow on citrate, but allow them to keep all the mutations that they have that allowed them to grow better on the citrate? And the prediction is, so we've, we force them to live in the ancestral niche. You might say, why don't we just remove, by the way, some of you thinking experimental design issues might say the easy experiment to do is just take the citrate out of the medium. The problem with that is the citrate is in there as a chelating agent and so it's sort of an important part of the medium. So we couldn't do that trick, so instead we pulled the rug out from under the citrate positive bacteria by making a time series of bacteria that had evolved as citrate positive bacteria and then we make them citrate minus by undoing that one mutation that made them citrate positive in the first place. And the prediction is if the valley is getting deeper, this is going to be a downward fitness trajectory. And in fact, that's what we observe, that the hybrids, the sort of artificial hybrids that we make at the earliest generation are more fit than the artificial hybrids that we make from the later generations. And so this combination of refinement and this loss of ability in the ancestral niche is I would say, you know, whether a new species or becoming a new species, it's showing us that in fact this kind of way of looking at the world, this way of understanding how invading new ecological circumstances may put populations on different paths is creating uh, this maladaptive intermediate state. So to summarize, experimental evolution is, I think, a lot of fun. I enjoy it because it lets us do this sort of travel in time that we all dream about and so much science fiction is about, we can, at least in this very small little world, instantiate that process and explore the tension between chance and necessity. In this experiment, we observed a lot of parallel evolution. I, I emphasized how much we observed, but maybe I overemphasized that. It's far from perfect, but there's nonetheless this clear signal that natural selection is very powerful at fishing out the same relatively rare events if they confer enough of a benefit and uh, allowing evolution to proceed along similar paths. The little interlude with the uh, cystic fibrosis study shows that pathogens are also evolving and that the study of parallelism allows us to not just say things are changing, but to kind of ask what matters to the bugs? What was it? What genes and what functions affected by those genes are systematically and repeatedly changing in patients that are associated with the adaptation of the bacteria to that lung environment. We also saw, despite all this parallelism, we saw this divergence that led to the appearance of a novel function, one that's not historically associated with E. coli, even though it's been this model system for many decades. We showed that this discovery, this evolutionary discovery of the novelty depended on not just a single genetic event, but this sort of historically contingent accumulation of contextual changes and that at least by some ways of looking at it, this lineage that evolved the new function is becoming a, a distinct species. So an experiment like this, it's gone on for 27 years and some, I've only listed a few of the people who participated in it. Uh, I've tried to mention a few of them along the way. 
uh, but just I've been so fortunate to have super postdocs, grad students, undergrads, and one I always like to especially call out, I've been really incredibly fortunate, I think I was talking to Rick Grossberg who was expressing some things, people who help you manage a lab are just, they're sort of often the heroes and heroines of science. So right now Nirja Hajala has been in my lab for 15 years and keeps things going uh, just beautifully and before that Lynette and Sue. And most of this work uh, uh, has been funded uh, uh, by the National Science Foundation and I would be happy to try to answer questions. Uh, so, there, the parallel mutation, I don't know whether I can give an exact number on that, but there's a lot of parallelism that is strictly point mutation. So there's some essential genes that in fact have been evolving in our system. Um, and so 12 out of 12 populations, or in some cases, you know, 8 or 10 out of 12, have different non-synonymous mutations in those genes. Um, there are some cases, there's a, a case of a particular operon which has been deleted in 12 out of 12 populations. So we do see some parallelisms of that. Um, the deletions, one endpoint is identical in every case and the other endpoint is different in every case. So there's kind of a mechanism involving uh, mob, uh, insert, something called insertion sequences where there's one copy there, these things kind of move around in the genomes and if they create a second copy, those two copies can homologously recombine and then you end up with a deletion. So we've seen that and we've seen some cases where some of the populations seem to do it by point mutations and some seem to do it by, um, uh, by other kinds of mutations. I, I think uh, Michael Torelli was asking this, but I'm pretty confident without being able to put numbers on it that the bulk of the adaptation has involved point mutations, despite clearly some other beneficial mutations. But uh, uh, even in those cases where it can be done both ways, you know, 11 populations did it by a point mutation and one maybe did it by an indel of some sort. But eh, that's kind of a waffly answer. That's but the best I can do at this point. And I think there is a question. Yes, right. I'm wondering if Darwin wasn't contradicting himself. You said at the beginning, he said that evolution is very slow and slow. The first chapter, The Origin of Species, deals with planet and animal breeding. Yes. And then he even came back to that and published a book separately. Absolutely. So, so there it's clearly, it's not at the speed here. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And just in case anybody didn't hear that, so in fact, I sometimes mention that, and this time I didn't. So he, one of his spectacular lines of evidence was breeding of plants and animals. But actually, even in that chapter in The Origin, he has a passage, and I believe it's in that chapter or one of the recapitulations, where he says, unless we have drawings of the breeds from a long time ago, we really can't see much of that. So it's, I'm kind of... You know, these are gray areas, but it was interesting how, despite using that argument and that human plant and animal breeding had changed things, most of that was in the past. And unless we, ha he used the phrase something like very careful drawings had been made long ago. Um, so anyhow, but it, it is a tension. You know, he was, he, he was a very smart guy. So absolutely, you know, even though I'm quoted a little bit too much like an absolute, he was wrestling with the pace of these changes and, and so on. So that's a great observation. Yes, Michael. Chris, did you map the genes responsible for the loss of fitness in hybrids, and were they responsible for the increased adaptation? In no, we would like to do that. Um, I think uh, Zach has got pretty good evidence that at least a couple of the genes are responsible for those things, but there could also be some that are hitchhikers in one direction that are causing losses in the other. So that's also a great point. So I think it's very difficult work, but I think it's going to turn out that at least some of the loss in the ancestral niche is associated with uh, the adaptation to the new niche. But I did not show you that, and that's even more in progress than what I showed you there. But I believe that's sort of the way some of Zach's work is going at this point. Yeah. Yeah, I think it tells us they're arising often. Um, so one caveat, of course, 
you might say, well, geez, you know, they say they found this thing that's never happened in the wild. But of course, this probably things like it happen all the time in the wild. But because there are other bacteria already using citrate, it's sort of the fact that there's this open uh, kind of island with something that uses one resource and not the other. So there's probably lots of things blinking on and off. Uh, so that's one answer to it. You know, a lot of, yeah, yeah, I think there's undoubtedly this kind of stuff going. Most microbiologists, Jonathan can correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, a lot of times, because it's so diverse and these microbiomes and soil microbiota and stuff are so complex, people often use sort of operational definitions, like, you know, the 16S is this similar or this dissimilar. I like Fred Cohan, who's a professor at Wesleyan Universe, University, university, university. His kind of, he has a conceptual definition which is, says they're kind of becoming different species when they get on irreversible evolutionary paths, whether that involves potential for blocking recombination or not. So he, I think ours would fit with his definition, but the problem is to study that for you know, the million bacteria in a gram of soil. You know, most people are looking for operational definitions, but my hunch would be that this kind of stuff is happening constantly in the bacterial world, and we rarely see it, and this is a chance to catch it in action in a very simplified context. Well, if there's no more questions, let's thank you. Oh, there is one. Let's, yep. So, would you comment on uh, the uh, recon, or the uh, mutation frequency per locus with respect to cycle time? Uh, by cycle time, you mean generation? Well, uh, yeah, generation. The clock. the clock thing, meaning like a molecular clock, or sorry, I'm not getting the right context. So I can say a few things, and then if you well, would like, you can expand on it. Well, you know, if uh, organisms that have a long cycle time uh, have, a, in some cases, have lower have a lower frequency imitation for both of this. I see. So one of the fascinating things to me about E. coli uh, is so. If you, we know, and from our work and other work, we have a pretty good estimate of what the point mutation rate is on a per base pair level, and we know the size of the genome. E. coli is incredibly conservative. Across their entire genome, at least for point mutations, there's only in a typical strain that has fully intact DNA repair mechanisms, there's probably only about one mutation every 1,000 cell divisions or so. So it's quite low, much lower than what we would think of it may be a bit higher on a per site basis than what we would have in metazoa and metaphyta, but in fact, given the genome size, they're just incredibly conservative. They're, you know, most things are just perfect copy of the previous generation. But because of the huge population sizes, there's, I, I calculated that uh, on the face of the earth, E. coli experiences every possible double mutation, I can't remember whether I calculated every day or what, there's about 10 to the 23 E. coli uh, on the face of the earth. So even if their point mutation rate is 10 to the minus 10th, you know, every double mutation somewhere is, is happening. So they make up, they have a very conservative genetic system, but the numbers mean there's also just an incredible supply of variation. So I hope that at least partly. Well, if you, so if you had, any, if you had some E. coli, for example, which had find one and have a cycle time that is 10 times slower than you expect to find. I see. So you can, and I, you know, there is a bit of a literature on this. Um, I think, I, I don't, you, there is, if you grow them in different media at different rates or at different temperatures at different rates, I think there is a slight growth rate dependence of mutation rate, but I actually don't know that literature and how, it's something people could revisit with whole genome sequencing and get much better evidence than say a lot of the classic experiments allow, but I don't know that off the top of my head. When you get to like high, really high temperatures, then you're inducing stress responses and causing other problems. But uh, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, you know, people like um, um, Howard Ochman who studies molecular evolution of, of of E. coli and its relatives, you know, what is the average cycle time or generation time of E. coli in nature? And that's not something we really know very well. And sort of the estimates is maybe one generation a day as opposed to, say, the seven generations a day we get. So they're certainly in terms of estimating some of the molecular clock in bacteria, I think, you know, I think it's reasonably well known, but there's room for several fold uncertainties there.
I'm happy to stay and answer a few more questions.